Hi class, so we're going to jump back into Nightbooks by J.A. White, and I'm going to be starting with Chapter 6, The Misting Room. So um, I hope you enjoy. Here we go. <clears throat> Alex sat on the desk a long, at the desk a long time, staring at a blank piece of paper. He figured it was safest to follow Natasha's instructions for now, but unfortunately he couldn't think of anything to write. It didn't help that he could feel Lenore's eyes on him, watching his every move. He was used to writing in the middle of the night without a single sound to disturb him. Could you go somewhere else? Alex finally asked, glaring at the cat. I can't concentrate while you, with you staring at me like that. Lenore vanished. That doesn't help, Alex exclaimed. I know you're still there. After a few moments, the cat reappeared on top of the desk. Alex nearly fell backwards in surprise. Lenore sauntered back to her spot on the stool. This is why people like dogs, Alex muttered. He pulled out a pencil and started writing random sentences on the paper, just to look like he was working. To be honest, Lenore wasn't the only reason he couldn't concentrate. Unanswered questions pulled his mind in all directions. Can I trust Yasmin? Is there a way out of this apartment? What's that sound behind the walls? And why was Natasha so interested in it? Am I ever going to see my family again? Then there were the books. Like all writers, Alex was first and foremost a reader and it was impossible to focus on his own story when so many others lay within easy reach. His gaze strayed to the tantalizing volumes winding along the spiral staircase, a thousand worlds begging to be explored. I'll pick a book at random and read a single story Alex finally decided, just to get it out of my system. The moment, approached, the moment he approached the staircase, however, Lenore leaped off her stool and blocked his path. She didn't hiss, but there was no mistaking the threat in her eyes. Stop wasting time, she seemed to say. Do your work. Alex thought about testing her. She was just a cat, after all. But then he remembered the long scratches on Yasmin's arms and decided to return to his seat. No sense being reckless, he thought. Not until I have a better idea what's going on here. He was starting to get hungry again, but he figured he should at least get a few words down before eating, just in case Natasha came home and checked his progress. He pulled out a fresh sheet of paper and hunched over it, pencil in hand. What should I write about, he thought. Monsters? Ghosts? School? As hard as he tried, the ideas refused to come. After another fruitless hour, the grumbling in his stomach proved impossible to ignore. Alex rose from his seat. Lenore looked up, annoyed by the disturbance. I'm just getting something to eat, Alex said. That okay with you? The cat stretched languorously in response, then dropped to the floor with a surprising grace and waited for Alex to lead the way. He passed through the closet door, feeling a sense of relief upon returning to the apartment, like that first footstep on solid ground after a long boat ride, and entered the kitchen. As Yasmin had promised, there wasn't much of a selection in the cabinet beneath the kitchen sink, just bread, stale crackers, a few cans of tuna fish, and a jar of store brand peanut butter. After digging behind some cleaning supplies, however, Alex discovered a half-filled box of Fruit Loops, only slightly past its expiration date. Look at this, he exclaimed, showing the box to the uninterested cat. My favorite. If it was Cap'n Crunch or Grape Nuts, I might have given up all hope. But this makes me think that everything might end up okay. He popped a handful of Fruit Loops into his mouth. They were stale, but delicious. Want some? Alex placed a few Fruit Loops in his open palm and held his hand out to Lenore. She sniffed the multicolored rings cautiously. Go ahead, he said. You'll like them. Everyone does. Lenore bent forward, opening her mouth the slightest bit. Then she backed away, finding, fixing Alex with a look of distrust. Your loss, Alex said, returning the Fruit Loops to their hiding spot like buried treasure. He returned to his bedroom and pulled a night book from his backpack. I'm not going to finish a new story by tonight, he told Lenore, so I might as well pick one that I've already written. Is that okay with you? Lenore didn't seem thrilled by his change of plans, but she didn't do anything to stop him either. As Alex settled into the antique love seat in the living room, she vanished as a mild form of protest. He held the night book in front of his face and pretended to search for a story. His true attention, however, was focused just above the book on the wall directly across from him. It was the place where the front door should have been. Alex hadn't exactly lied to Lenore. He really did want to pick out a good story. In fact, there was part of him that was even looking forward to sharing his writing with Natasha tonight. But that wasn't the main purpose of his plan. Mostly he wanted to see what happened when Natasha re-entered the apartment. Despite Yasmin's warning, Alex was still sitting, still set on escaping, and he needed a better understanding of how the only exit from the apartment worked. He watched, 
He waited. Finally, Natasha came home. The transformation was simple. One moment there was a wall, and the next moment there was a door. Natasha opened it and stepped across the threshold. Her hair and clothes were soaking wet. Alex heard no rain or thunder through the windows of the apartment, but it must have been pouring outside. Girl, Natasha screamed. Girl, get me some towels now. She shook her head and water flew everywhere. Knew I should have brought an umbrella, but I hate lugging those things everywhere I go. She sat down and tried to pull off a single boot. It made a big sucking sound, like a shoe embedded in mud, but refused to budge. Girl, she screamed, her face growing red. Where are you? Alex realized two things at the same time. One, Natasha hadn't noticed that he was sitting there. And two, she had left the front door wide open. Alex heard his brother's voice in his head. Move, freakazoid, and barrel towards freedom. He caught a glimpse of Natasha digging one finger into her ear, looking remarkably unconcerned by his escape attempt, and then he leaped forward and slammed straight into a wall where the door had been. Natasha, now digging in her other ear, gave Alex a dismissive glance as he slid to the ground. Girl, she screamed, where are those towels? Dinner for Natasha, at least, was chicken medallion sautéed in garlic sauce, corn on the cob, and mounds of mashed potatoes with gravy. Alex's stomach grumbled watching her eat it all, but he didn't say a word, just stood in the corner and occasionally refilled her glass with fresh lemonade when beckoned. After his failed attempt to pass through the front door, Alex figured that he should take a wait-and-see approach before hatching any new escape plans. While Natasha ate dessert, a homemade brownie topped with vanilla ice cream and hot fudge, Alex cleared the table and washed the dishes. By the time he entered the living room, Natasha was waiting for him. She sat in a huge chair of luxurious black leather, its wooden frame spiraling upward in three tall spires. Alex thought it looked like the chair of an evil queen too poor to afford a proper throne. It's about time, Natasha said. She gestured towards a far humbler chair to her right. Sit. Alex lowered himself into the chair. Yasmin was sitting on the antique love seat directly across from him. She looked meekly down at her lap. In Natasha's presence, she was a completely different girl from the one he had met earlier. Alex picked up the night book he had left on the side of the table and prepared to read. Wait, Natasha snapped. Do I look ready to you? I haven't even set up my misting room yet. I don't know what that is. And whose fault is that? Alex bit back a snarky response. No good can come from making her mad, he thought. Instead, he waited patiently while Natasha traced her fingers through the air like someone scanning book spines for a specific title. What the heck is she doing, he wondered. After searching a bit longer, Natasha squeezed her thumb and index finger together and drew her hand down as though unzipping the very air itself. There was a tiny hissing noise like a leaking tire, and Natasha reached into what seemed to be an invisible pocket, her arm vanishing up to the elbow. She noticed Alex's astonished expression and grinned with pleasure. This is some kind of spell, ain't it? she asked. You know any other witch who can do magic like this? I don't know any other witches. Well, they can't, Natasha screeched, digging deeper into the invisible hole. You should consider yourself very lucky. She withdrew her arm, and there was a red cylinder in her hand. It had a tiny hole at the top and two buttons on the side. What's that? Alex asked. An oil diffuser, Natasha said, setting it on the stand next to her. Oh, Alex said, disappointed. He wondered why Natasha would bother to hide such a common machine. My mom has one of those. She used to make our living room smell nice when we had visitors. This one's a little different, Natasha said. She reached into her pocket and produced a glass vial filled with blue liquid that swirled like a miniature storm. What's that? Alex asked. Her storyteller. Hey, storyteller, Natasha said. She poured the vial into the hole at the top of the diffuser. Do you know what happens to children who ask too many questions? Alex shook his head. Me either, Natasha said, because no one ever hears from them again. She threw her head back and cackled loudly. It was terrifying. The goose flesh rising from Alex's skin was evidence enough of that. So kind of like um, goosebumps, but you can also call them goose pimples when you get those little things when you're scared or cold sometimes. But it also a bit affected, as though Natasha had watched The Wizard of Oz one too many times and practiced her cackle in the mirror. I have a bone to pick with you, storyteller, Natasha said, her fingers digging into his flesh. I thought I had been perfectly hospitable. Yet you tried to escape the first chance you got. That's not very polite, is it? Alex's stomach clenched. 
Here it comes, he thought, closing his eyes. Some kind of horrific spell. Natasha released his wrist. I'll let it pass, this time, she said, on the understanding that you've gotten such nonsense out of your system. There'll be consequences if it happens again. You understand? Say yes, Natasha. Alex hesitated as long as he dared. Yes, Natasha, he said, his cheeks flushed with anger. Good, she said. Natasha pressed the bottom button on an oil diffuser, and the machine hummed to life. At first Alex thought that nothing had happened, but then he saw the way that the air shimmered in front of him and reached out a hand. His fingers touched a solid, invisible wall. Four walls, Natasha said. She pointed up, and a ceiling, of course. My misting room. She pressed the top button on the oil diffuser, and a blue mist issued from a tiny hole, taking the shape of the invisible room. Alex thought of a fish tank filled with blue-tinged air instead of water. Natasha inhaled deeply. What is that stuff? Alex wondered. I see you've got a rebellious streak to you, she said. The walls of the misting room muffled her words the slightest bit. Yasmin here did as well, but now she and I have come to an understanding. She knows better than to ever think about crossing me. Isn't that right, Yasmin? Yes, Natasha, the girl said without hesitation. Natasha turned to him and smiled. Alex thought it was how a cobra might smile if equipped with lips and two full rows of teeth. You'll feel the same in time, she said. Though I have to confess that I am a little disappointed. I thought you might like it here from the start. After all, I haven't given, haven't I given you exactly what you most desire? What are you talking about? Alex asked. Natasha laughed at his confused expression. Come now, storyteller, he, she said. You can lie to me, but don't lie to yourself. I watched you carefully while you were reading your story last night. You loved hearing an appreciative audience. I could see it on your face. You didn't look like a boy who had lost his freedom. You looked like a boy who had found it. All I want to do is go home, Alex said. I'm sure you do, Natasha said. And yet, I bet there's a part of you that's been looking forward to telling me a story all day. You probably already picked one out, didn't you? Alex wanted to not deny it, but he could tell from Natasha's smug smile that the truth was written on his face. So, he asked, I want to make sure you liked it, because you enjoy the attention, I like, like I said. My guess is that you never share these wonderful nightmares you've set on paper. Are you afraid of what people might think? A young boy with such a hideous imagination? You don't know anything about me, he said, his face burning. Then teach me, Natasha said. Let's start with something simple. Why did you sneak out in the middle of the night to destroy your night books? I don't want to talk about that, Alex said. The witch nodded. What you want doesn't really matter here, and waited for him to answer. She drummed her long nailed fingers on the arm of the chair. It's not important, he said. Click. Click, click, click. Why do you even care? Click, 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 click. Alex could see that Natasha was starting to lose patience. He didn't want to tell her everything, but staying completely silent was not an option. There would be consequences. Tell her the truth, he thought, just not the whole truth. I wanted to be normal, he said. I didn't want to be Alex Mosher anymore, that fat, geeky kid who knows how to make fake blood and can name all the actors who played Michael Myers in the Halloween movies. I wanted to fit in, to be like other kids, and I thought that destroying my night books would be a step in the right direction. I spent so much time on those stories. I loved them with all my heart. I didn't want to destroy them. I needed to. That was the only way I could prove to myself that I was serious about changing. Alex glanced in Yasmin's direction and saw her staring at him with a thoughtful expression. As soon as their eyes met, she looked away. Alex, 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 Natasha said. Destroying a few notebooks isn't going to change what you are. You have darkness running through your veins, just like me. She settled back in her seat and took a deep breath of the blue mist. Now, spin me a tale, she said, and this time, make it scary. All right, so we're going to get into um, one of his night book stories. You can see that it's in the handwriting again, the type that looks like handwriting. Mr. Boots. Mr. Boots was a white teddy bear with little red boots. Tom brought him everywhere. He pushed Mr. Boots on the swing in his backyard. He held Mr. Boots close during the scary parts of his TV shows. At night when he was supposed to be sleeping, Tom whispered in Mr. Boots' ears. Sometimes Mr. Boots whispered back. Years passed. Tom got older and Mr. Boots moved from his bed to his bookshelf. There are new things to play with. A basketball, an iPad, a 3DS. Then bad things started to happen. Tom went to use the iPad one day and saw the screen was cracked. 
He woke up and found his 3DS drowned in a sink full of water. Each time a toy broke, Tom would find Mr. Boots on his bed instead of the bookshelf. It was like the teddy bear hoped that Tom would remember him again, now that his new toy was gone. Tom started to grow suspicious. Except a teddy bear couldn't break an iPad. It couldn't fill a bathroom sink with water. That was crazy. Then one day, Tom heard his new basketball hissing air and found a gash made with something sharp. When Mr. Boots appeared in Tom's bed the next morning, his tiny red boots were splattered with mud, as though he had been outside in the backyard where the basketball was. Tom decided enough was enough. He threw the teddy bear in the garbage. The next morning, Mr. Boots was back in Tom's bed again. He smelled like banana peels and coffee grounds. Now Tom was scared. He knew he couldn't tell his parents what was going on. They would never believe him. And so he waited until their family vacation. It was a sunny place so far away that they needed to take a plane to get there. Tom brought Mr. Boots, and on the last day of the vacation, he buried him in the sand. This time, Mr. Boots didn't come back. After a while, Tom forgot all about the stuffed animal. He figured it had just been his imagination. Eventually, he moved away from home and went to college. There he met a girl. They got married and had a son named Oliver. One snowy night, Tom woke up because he thought he heard whispering from Oliver's room. Giggles. Tom didn't much think of it. Think much of it. Oliver was an imaginative child, just as he had been, and Tom went back to sleep. The next morning, Oliver was gone. Tom and his wife searched the house, but he was nowhere to be found. Finally, they went outside in the freshly fallen snow, and they could see their son's footprints leading into the nearby woods. Next to them were a set of smaller footprints, the kind made with little red boots. They never saw Oliver again. Whew! That's kind of spooky, huh? They sat in silence until the blue mist came to a sputtering stop. Natasha breathed in the last of it. The walls of the misting room vanished on their own, leaving behind the strangely sweet smell of gingerbread cookies. I like the ending of that one, Natasha said. It's so hopeless. Um, thanks? You write that whole thing today? Alex started to nod. He wanted Natasha to think that he was working hard, but then stopped himself. He had thought of an idea. If I phrase this just right, maybe I can get the library all to myself. Actually, I wrote that story last year, Alex said. I meant to read you a new one tonight, something really special, but I couldn't write a single word all day. Natasha straightened in her seat. Why not, she asked. Is it my library good enough for you? It's beautiful, a perfect place to write. Alex hesitated, as though reluctant to tattle on a friend. It's just, you know what, it doesn't matter. Out with it, Natasha exclaimed. What's the problem? Alex blew out a breath, as though Natasha had convinced him to share something that he was planning to keep to himself. It's really hard to concentrate with someone staring at me, he said. I can't write anything at all. Natasha leaned forward in her seat and pointed a single finger at Yasmin. The girl shook her head, too terrified to speak. I told you specifically to show the boy to the library and then get out of his way. Not Yasmin, Alex exclaimed. She's been very helpful. Seriously, there's no reason to get mad at her. I was talking about Lenore. Natasha lowered her finger. Yasmin relaxed and glanced at Alex with the slightest hint of gratitude. Ah, said Natasha, chuckling. Let's see what we can do about that. Get over here, you mangy beast. Lenore appeared at the witch's feet. She was already cringing, as though some kind of punishment was a foregone conclusion. It's really okay, Alex said, suddenly afraid for the orange cat. Honestly, I hardly know she's there at... The witch raised her hand, and Lenore rocketed into the air. Her long tail extended straight towards the ceiling, as though it were being yanked by an invisible hand. The cat thrashed wildly, hissing in pain. Why were you disturbing the storyteller? Natasha asked when the cat had risen to eye level. It's very important, he writes those stories. Very important. You understand me? It wasn't her fault, Alex said. Stop hurting her. Natasha snapped her fingers, and Lenore plummeted to the ground. She managed to land on all four paws and ran out of the room. That old beast won't bother you any more, Natasha said. Now you can write until your hand falls off. She held his gaze and smiled without warmth. No more excuses, storyteller. Whew. So how do you think um, he's feeling about um, the other, other people and animal that he's um, trapped with in there? Are you noticing kind of a change in his attitude towards them? 
by the way Lenore um, was treated. Interesting. Chapter 7. The Girl Who Followed a Unicorn Alex woke up early the next morning. He found some clean clothes about his own size hanging in the closet and knocked on Yasmin's door. No one answered. Alex figured that she'd already passed through the coat closet door and started her work for the day. What is Natasha making her do? Alex wondered, remembering the scratches along Yasmin's arms, her dirt-stained face. Something messy for sure. I'm going to pause my video here. Um, it looks like um, there's something going on I need to fix on it, so I'm going to just pause it here, but I'll start my next video at chapter 7. I only read the first page, so I'll hop back in later.